Let's start here, New York's Bryant Park on a beautiful day. And as Andrew McLaughlin, former director of public policy at Google tells me, a perfect metaphor for the internet as we know it. For the internet, we built this incredible common space. Platforms like Facebook and Twitter were created, blogging platforms where anybody could show up and speak. A virtual town square where freedom of expression would allow us to share our ideas, the good ones and the bad. The idea, though, of the marketplace of ideas was that as people came to the square, they would hear the racist and they would hear the anti-racist and they would gravitate towards the true. But that might have been idealistic. Economists for a hundred years have had this principle which is called the tragedy of the commons that says if you have a common space, a park, and anybody can go and use it without controls, the tragedy will be that that space gets trashed. Fast forward to the internet today, social networks promise to democratize information. But in the last year, Russians have bought ads on Facebook to target voters, aiming to sway an election. An army of bots is spreading propaganda through Twitter and hate speech is going viral, turning offline. The virtual town square is getting overrun. The racists can attach their racist and abusive speech to every single tweet, every single post. You can create a fake account. So in the public square here, imagine if the racist could just basically like build an infinite number of robots to overwhelm noisily people on the other side of the line. So that's what we've allowed to happen on the internet. As a result, these platforms are falling into an uncomfortable role as the gatekeepers of content. And it's not just Facebook and Google. Internet backbone companies you probably haven't even heard of hold that power too. I think it is really risky if you have a group of essentially 10 tech CEOs that if you somehow offend all 10 of them, that you can effectively not be on the internet anymore. The irony? Matthew Prince is talking about himself. I woke up to a Twitter stream full of screenshots from their forums where they were claiming that not only um, would we not kick them off, but we wouldn't kick them off because our senior leadership were white supremacists and Nazis. That customer, the Daily Stormer, a site for neo-Nazis. We got to a point with this particular customer that we said, you know, enough is enough. We're going to terminate this customer. You might not have heard of Prince's company Cloudflare, but it's essentially a backbone of the internet. They help sites run faster and they protect them from attacks online. 2.8 billion people pass through their network every month, according to Prince. And Cloudflare has some controversial customers, but has generally taken a hands-off approach. You said, I woke up in a bad mood and decided someone shouldn't be allowed on the internet. No one should have that power. What a strong statement. We kicked them off at some level because they were jerks. And I think we have the right to pick and choose who we do business with and not do business with jerks. But, but I do think it's important for us to have a conversation about what the responsibilities of the plumbers are on the right. internet. There's always been this narrative that we're the pipes. You know, the information goes through us. We're not responsible. So at what point do you say we're not just the pipes? We've always thought if the deep infrastructure of the internet was making editorial decisions, that felt wrong. While there may be little sympathy for neo-Nazis, the decision was a trigger and the requests started pouring in. We terminated one customer, yeah. and only one customer. There are, since that time, have been calls for over 3,500 different Cloudflare customers to be terminated. I worry that having made this one decision, that it's going to be harder for us to push back against those others. If the internet is a town square, you could call Twitter your megaphone, amplifying voices, shaping the conversation. It's what Ev Williams, who co-founded the company, always wanted. You've always been someone who's believed that if we could speak freely, the world would be a better place. Has your view changed at all? It's become more nuanced, and I think I still fundamentally believe that, but I also think we were naive about it in some ways. How were you naive? One example is just people won't feel free if there are certain types of behaviors dominating a conversation or putting them down. As they've grown into power and influence, companies like Twitter and Facebook are grappling with the more nuanced questions about what to allow on their platform. The difference between a difference of opinion or a political belief and a difference in like wrong facts is 
really hard to suss out, and I don't think anyone's figured out how to suss that out automatically, and that's when some people are calling for there needs to be editorial guidelines, and you get into an area where most tech companies be like, ah, it's not something that really fits in our model or that we would even be good at. Increasingly, you guys, whether or not you like it, have to make some decisions that are kind of editorial, wouldn't you say? I think the, the fact that tech companies have to accept is there are judgments being made all the way down the line. Um, there's judgments about how the algorithm works, what the system values, what the feedback loops are. What do you say to the folks as Twitter kicks off the neo-Nazis and some members of the alt-right, what do you say to the folks who are angry at that, who are saying these companies are acting as editors, they're curbing free speech? The rules are there to maximize uh, the quality of discourse and ability for everybody to have a voice. Of course, if you're on one side versus and you see that as, as censorship, I, I get that argument. I think the question is, are you adding value or not? In a politically polarized environment, that question of value is divisive. Tech companies are now facing questions about their own ideology. And if you want to be a part of the world's most influential conservative digital media organization, it started with this one email from, from one of our supporters saying, hey, you know, I was at, at the office today and I remembered watching this video last night and I wanted to show it to my colleague, but I, I pulled it up on my uh, browser in the office and I wasn't able to find the video. What happened? Did you take the video down? I met with Marissa Stride in L.A. Now, you can't really go too far here without walking onto a movie set, but this one is different. It's for Prager University. They produce online videos for YouTube, segments that promote conservative ideology. With hundreds of students... To clarify, Prager University is not an actual we university. Are not, we are not a university. We believe that not all universities, but many universities in America, for the most part, have professors and leadership of a left-wing ideological bias. PragerU was founded by Dennis Prager in 2011. He's a divisive radio host and conservative commentator. Take a look. The massive amount of anti-Semitism and racism that the Trump election unleashed, that was all a lie, pure lie, 100% lie. Uh, no, that's not true. Wait, I'm sorry, but speaking yes, as yes, someone who was, uh, let, wait a minute, okay. I cannot let you get away with that. As someone uh, you know, Our topics are ideological in nature, so we do pro-America, we believe in economic freedom, Currently, there are about 250 PragerU videos on YouTube. They're targeted for a younger viewership. PragerU says 60% of their audience is under 34. But they've encountered a problem. We noticed that some of the videos were getting restricted, and more and more of them were getting restricted as the months went by. According to YouTube, restricted mode is a setting used to screen potentially mature content. We want high school students to watch our videos. Most places of work and libraries, school libraries, will put restrictions on their browsers because they don't want young people or employees sitting at libraries watching pornography and violence. So they reached out to Google, which owns YouTube. And we kept going back to them and said, you know, there's no pornography in our, in our videos. Would you define some of these videos as controversial? We've always been very clear about our mission. We do know that we present a certain ideology that may or may not agree with everyone. So I guess if you don't agree with our ideology, you would say it's controversial, right? About 35 PragerU videos are currently restricted, according to Marissa, including these. The truth doesn't serve the purposes of feminist activists or vote-seeking politicians. All those diversity administrators, they depend for their livelihood, that means their paycheck, on creating victims. The sexes are different. Rather than trying to quash this reality, which can only lead to more needless confusion and suffering, not less, we should step back and marvel at it. On its site, YouTube says it uses a combination of video titles, descriptions, metadata, and community guideline reviews to filter out potentially mature content. When asked specifically about PragerU, Google responded broadly in a statement. Giving viewers the choice to opt in to a more restricted experience is not censorship. In fact, this is exactly the type of tool that Congress has encouraged online. And now the question is, is Google the one who gets to decide what everybody gets to watch? Do you have an idea of what you guys would have to do to get those videos unrestricted, to make videos that wouldn't be restricted? My question is, do we need to change our ideology? I sure hope not. While tech companies have the right to make these decisions, there's the question of transparency. 
And we could have done it differently. We could have just said they violated Section 13G of our terms of service and swept it under the but rug. That's and, kind of BS. And by the way, right? it's totally. It's, and it's not. It would be BS if we did it. And it's BS when any other technology company does it. And that's the point, which is important. There are arbitrary decisions that get made in this, and there are editorial decisions that get made in this. We should own those editorial decisions. And then there's the fundamental question of what happens when people get kicked off, those no longer allowed in the virtual town square. There's a principle that evil festers in darkness. And so one of the things you don't want to do is suppress racist speech in a world where they can just go elsewhere and do their evil in darkness. It is important for the world to see that if there are like racists, we should see who they are. We should be able to find their speech. There's consequences to not only what we see online, but also what we don't see. So you have to think about how do people see what? I think the product balance to be struck here is, can we find ways to elevate and suppress without censoring? 